بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لنعمة الإسلام وما كنا نهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وسبحان الله العزيز الجبار الملك القدوس الحي المميت ولا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد خاتم الأنبياء والرسل أجمع والرسل أجمعين النبي الأمين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الميامين وعلى أصحابه المختارين اللهم يا رب العالمين اللهم مصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا واصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا آخرتنا التي فيها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر لا إله إلا أنت سبحان الله الله سبحانه وتعالى إن سورة النور reminds us in the most powerful and most direct in the most powerful and most direct way of an ethical core to our very being. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان ومن يتبع خطوات الشيطان فإنه يأمر بالفحشاء والمنكر ولولا فضل ربكم عليكم ولولا فضل الله عليكم ورحمته ما زكى منكم من أحد ولكن الله يزكي من يشاء والله سميع عليم ولا يأتلي أولي الفضل منكم والسعة أن يؤتوا أولي القربى والمساكين والمهاجرين في سبيل الله وليعفوا وليصفحوا ألا تحبون أن يغفر الله لكم والله غفور رحيم A more direct message and a more powerful message is not possible. It deserves pause. Allah reminds believers and extorts believers, exhorts believers not to follow the footsteps of the shaitan. In other words, not to take the path that Allah associates with the demonic. And the demonic, by definition, 
is the antithesis of a Rabbani or the antithesis of the divine. If the divine is light, then the demonic is darkness. If the divine is mercy, then the demonic is cruelty. If the divine is rationality, then the demonic is irrationality. If the divine is justice, then the, de then the demonic is injustice. Don't follow the path of the demonic. لا تتبع خطوات الشيطان. And Allah summarizes what the nature of the demonic is in saying that the demonic exhorts people attracts people, draws people towards al-fahsha' wal-munkar. And in fahsha' wal-munkar here can only have the meaning that I've set out the very antithesis of the Rabbani the very antithesis of the divine. Fahsha, the path of corruption and shame, and Munkar, the path of what we innately know is wrong, and what innately within the intuitive core of the human being. A human being knows is part of the darkness and not part of the light. And Allah gives us a very powerful hint in this. That Allah reminds us وَلَوْلَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتِهِ مَا زَكَّى مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنْ أَحَدٍ أَبَدًا وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يُزَكِّي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ And remember And remember that the most precarious moral path is one where you assume that whatever you embrace is consistent with divinity, is one where your ego becomes the guardian of the truth and the guardian of the path. It is as if Allah puts us on notice that in order to understand the difference between the demonic and the divine, you need to anchor your research in humility. You need to anchor your search in something beyond your own ego. You need to anchor your search in modesty, cautiousness, Circumscript, circumscript, 
circumspection, in cautiousness, and thoughtfulness about the about your path. Because guidance cannot be built upon presumptuousness and arrogance. But then Allah quickly reminds us that the pursuit of goodness the pursuit of divinity, that the avoidance of the demonic is anchored in the care for others. In, in fact, caring and taking care of others. Uli al-Qurba, to go beyond yourself, to think of the well-being of those who are close to you as relatives. Uli al-Qurba, family. Wal-Masakin, and those who are impoverished. muhajirin fi sabilillah. And all those who have become dispossessed, displaced. Waliafu waliasfahu. Egoism and the arrogance that accompanies egoism. Dooms you to an attitude of vindictiveness. And in never, never ending pettiness and anger towards others. The path of divinity is to get over yourself. The path of divinity is to transcend the egoism of the self, to associate and empathize and internalize the need of others, whether those others are family, or the disempowered and dispossessed, or the impoverished, and that your attitude towards life is anchored in a dynamic of forgiveness, not vindictiveness. The dynamic of and, and forgiveness itself is not possible without an attitude of benevolence, empathy, and goodness. The most remarkable thing in this passage of Surah An-Nur is how innate and primordial divinity and the values of divinity are to our very core and how sensible and intuitive and natural the understanding of the path of the demonic as the antithesis to the path of divinity. The demonic is not forgiving. The demonic 
is not reasonable. The demonic is not rational. The demonic is not benevolent. The demonic is not informed and knowledgeable. Indeed, the demonic is quick to judgment. The demonic is ignorant. The demonic is all that represents darkness in human life. Al-Fahsha wal-Munkar. But the companions of the Prophet والسلام, as close, although the language of the Quran was natural to them and very close to their very epistemological being, their very awareness, their very consciousness, they still sought clarification from the Prophet ﷺ. How do we recognize the path of divinity beyond caring for those who are needy, those who are disempowered, those who are displaced, those who are dispossessed, even beyond forgiveness, is there a methodology that can help us in being even more concrete in avoiding khatawat al-shaytan, the path of the demonic? And the Prophet ﷺ explained to his companions that one of you is not truly a believer. One of you is not truly a Muslim. Meaning, one of you has not truly submitted to the path of the divine and avoided the path of the demonic unless You treat people, you offer people, you interact with people in the way that you would want to be treated. What you deem to be good for yourself or what you would want for yourself if you were similarly positioned, if you were the orphan, if you were the needy relative, if you were the displaced, dispossessed, if you were the refugee, if you were the indigent, What would you want? That is the path and the methodology for a Rabbaniya, for divinity. When you speak from a position of self entitlement, from a position of being anchored in privilege and being unable to think of what you would have demanded and expected and wanted if you were similarly situated as those who are suffering. This is exactly the warning about Tezkiah. 
if you no longer can internalize, empathize, and internalize the suffering and the need of others, then you are far closer to khatawat al-shaytan, to the path of the demonic, than the path of divinity. Subhanallah, Allah doesn't follow the discourse on following in the path of the demonic by some form of instruction that says, well, as long as you accept Allah and the Prophet as your savior, then you don't have to worry about the demonic. Nothing in the Quran. You will find, in fact, in the Quran, a direct challenge to the idea that if you accept anything as your savior, then in fact, you have attained salvation. Nothing in the Quran will tell you that if you follow the sha'air, then you've attained salvation. The sha'air are the basic rituals of Islam. And Allah, what Allah says about the sha'air is that it is min taqwa al it is an exercise in piety. But even if you practice the sha'ir, practice the rituals, but you are unable to avoid al fahsha wal munkar, put simply, but you are oblivious to do al qurba to those who are blood relations and their needs. And if you are oblivious to the masakin, to the indigent and the needy, you neither think about them or ponder or internalize what they need, what they're going through, or if you are oblivious to the dispossessed and displaced, if you are a vindictive human being, that contributes to facade fil ard, to corruption on earth, rather than benevolence and forgiveness, kindness and mercy, then the rituals will avail you nothing. Because you will, you will be among those that uphold the rituals, but still follow in the path of shaitan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for us as Muslims, and Allah and his Prophet والسلام, have emphasized so much that our relationship to divinity and our proximity to our Rabbaniya the quality of our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is completely contingent on how we care for and how we help and how we assist others. Not in superficial displays of symbolism or any formalistic outward acts, but in a genuine, pure ethic of care and kindness. When this is so clear in our divine book, how is it that we Muslims find ourselves day after day in situations that are completely remote from the ethic of care that defines the path of divinity and that defines the antithesis of the path of the demonic. When you read, for instance, that there is a boat of Rohingya refugees A hundred and sixty people are on board of a boat of Rohingya refugees after having escaped Burma or Myanmar, going to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a poor country. And the refugee camps for the Rohingyas in Bangladesh are in horrible, horrible conditions. Being settled in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, not only do you suffer extremely high rates of disease and infection, and need and starvation. But there is constantly the threat of sexual assault and being trafficked by modern slavery rings. Many women and children end up being trafficked because of the extremely overcrowded and poor conditions of the refugee camps in Bangladesh. So many of the Rohingya choose to try to escape from these refugee camps in Bangladesh, riding the sea to try to reach Indonesia or Malaysia or Singapore The thing, though, is that when people are in these boats that are not seaworthy, and they will often end up stuck on these boats for months at a time, as the various countries in the world refuse to take them in. And as a result, many of them perish, end up dying on these boats from disease and starvation because no country will allow these boats to come to port. So in this particular incident, there's 160 people on 
board of a boat. And the boat has been stuck out on sea for the past three weeks. And human rights agencies are warning that people are dying off. Women or children are dying off in this overcrowded boat without water, without food, from either starvation or from death or from disease. In fact, it is already reported that 20 people are suspected to have died already on that boat. But I wish this boat was an exception. With a little bit of research, it turns out that this is a fairly common occurrence. And indeed, in a previous incident, 300 Rohingyas on a boat that escaped from Bangladesh trying to reach Indonesia ended up being stranded out on sea on that boat for six months. Eventually, Sri Lanka took that boat in. But by the time Sri Lanka did that, already an estimate of 30 women and children had perished on this boat during this six month period. And the number is suspected to be much higher. You have to pause and think. These are Muslims. I've already talked about this numerous times. Islamophobia explodes on the scene. You have tons or dozens of extremely wealthy, politically motivated Jews and Christians and Hindus and Buddhists pour money into creating an in this industry that demonizes Islam and demonizes Muslims. And as a result, not just Islamophobia in Europe and the United States, not just Donald Trump that rides on an anti-Islamic, Islamophobic propaganda campaign. But a genocide in China, a genocide in Kashmir, pre-genocide conditions in India in large, a genocide against the Rohingyas, a steady, steady waves of anti-Islamic bigotry and anti-Muslim racism. So much so that it even reaches into the realm of absurdity. As I'm sure many of you already know, when you have a soccer player like Messi wears a robe that in the Gulf countries they call a bisht. 
And Messi, where is this bisht in the World Cup? The amount of hate directed at an article of clothes associated with Arab and Muslim culture, whether authentically or not, is astounding. It reveals that Islamophobia has truly fed a racism industry. Imagine if Messi would have wore a yarmulke or wore a sombrero or wore any article of clothing associated with any other culture in the world but Arab and Islam. No one would have dared say a single word of criticism because everyone intuitively would have known that to do so would be pure racism and pure bigotry. But when Islamophobia has exploded to the extent that it did, and time and again you've heard me talk about how the enemies of Islam have sunk billions of dollars into maligning this religion and feeding and planting and cultivating hate against Muslims. And you've heard me talk about how wealthy Muslims at every level are absent from the game. Wealthy Muslims spend money buying technology firms, buying sports groups, buying luxury items, building fancy mosques, but they're absent. But what do you do about a situation where the Quran and the entire Islamic tradition teaches you that unless you are a Muslim who takes care and helps those who are disempowered and in need, Muslim and non-Muslim, but even at the very basic level, feeling for and caring for our fellow Muslim, and you find that it is absent. What do you do with the reality and truth that there is a considerable amount of racism about why we tolerate the abuse against the Rohingya. They're not white people. They're not like the masters, the colonizers. They look dark-skinned, poor, and undesirable. So the entire Muslim world sits around watching the genocide against the Rohingyas, watching the genocide against Kashmiris, watching the genocide in China, What do you think will be the dynamic in the hereafter when Allah tells us 
your fellow Muslim brothers and sisters were stranded on a boat for six months, children and women dying. And at the end, Sri Lanka, an un-Muslim country, took them in. And you Muslims were, for the most part, completely oblivious and absent. Are we really going to tell Allah that Allah we followed in the footsteps of divinity? Allah we truly avoided the footsteps of shaitan? When Allah has made it very clear what is needed for us to have the plausible claim that we avoided the footsteps of the demonic. What can look more demonic than Muslims stranded on a boat? I am sure as they starved to death, as children perished, can you imagine the amount of dua that were uttered by these men and women and children? Can you imagine the amount of pleading and begging with Allah to save them? Can you imagine what they thought about their fellow Muslims as the suffering continued day after day after day? Have we avoided the footsteps of shaitan? Have we avoided the demonic past? Have we clearly delineated and marked and set out the, divide, the path of the divine, the path of divinity? Have we clearly helped create an association in people's minds between the path of divinity and beauty and goodness? Or do we contribute, or do we contribute to a largely confused and confusing picture about the difference between the divine and the demonic? in the world we live in. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم سألوا الله يستجب لكم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم أفضل الصلاة والتسليم على محمد النبي الأمين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. What do we do with the Quranic message? What more can Allah do with us other than deny us free will and act for us and perform for us, which then would be the definition of injustice. If Allah in fact denied us free will and then either rewarded us and punished us. But with free will comes responsibility and accountability. And the only way free will can avoid the impurity of the demonic, put differently, the only way that free will can maintain its moral status is to perform 
what is moral and what is ethical. And Allah made it clear that what is moral and what is ethical is to get beyond yourself, to transcend your own pettiness, and to care, to care where you should care. When you read that yet again in the world we live in, yet again, that beginning December 18th, the start of Hanukkah or Hanukkah, Yet again, Jewish extremists converged on Al-Aqsa Mosque and violated the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. Marking their eight days, starting with December 18th of Hanukkah, Jewish extremists made it a point to underscore that they do not recognize and they do not honor Muslim claims over the Aqsa Mosque and thus violated the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque sent to send a clear message to Muslims that your claims and your sanctities mean nothing to us. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in what has now become a routine event, a redundant, repetitive event, Two brothers, Muhammad and Muhannad, Mutair, was killed by another Israeli extremist when they were run down, killed by a car that intentionally targeted them and ran them over killing both Muhammad and Muhannad in the Kalandiya refugee camp. In Jerusalem. And as to Israeli justice and what we can expect when two brothers such as these are run down by an Israeli extremist. A report that just came out says that in the last five years, in the numerous incidents where Israeli soldiers or Israeli settlers have been accused of abusing or murdering Palestinians. Indictments have followed in less than 1% of the hundreds of complaints received. And in fact, the story goes on to say that from 2017 to 2021, the Israeli military received 1,260 cases of alleged offenses committed by Israeli soldiers against Palestinians. 
409 of these cases involved the killing of Palestinians. But according to Israel's own, own data, criminal investigations were opened in just 21.4% of the complaints received. And only ultimately 11 investigations out of 248. So you receive 1,260 complaints. You actually investigate only 248. And out of these, only 11 yield indictments. But even the indictments, only a small percentage even got convicted. And among those who got convicted, In the overwhelming majority, those who were convicted received a suspended sentence. And in fact, the report goes on to note that overwhelmingly, indictments and convictions occur only in cases where the abuse was caught on camera. And there was no way around dismissing the allegations. But even then, even then, it is extremely rare for an Israeli who's committed abuse against a Palestinian or murder to receive an actual prison sentence. In fact, The report notes that at least 150 Palestinians have been killed, making 2022 the deadliest in 16 years. And in one particular incident, Israeli soldiers were caught on camera zip tying a 78-year-old Palestinian-American, an American citizen who happens to be Palestinian. He was caught on camera zip-tying the 78-year-old who was later found dead. No medical care was provided to the 78-year-old And the, Israel, and the soldiers who had custody of the man claimed they have no knowledge of how he died. And ultimately, nothing happened. Now, I note this because at the same time, Despite these grim facts on the ground, Netanyahu announces he has high hopes that during his tenure, he will conclude peace with Saudi Arabia and that relations between Israel and the Gulf states will be the best there ever been. This reeks of the demonic. And yet, yet, you still have Muslims who are so oblivious, 
so unthinking, so uncaring, that they cannot have an analytical bone in their body to evaluate what the Emirat and Saudi are doing with Israel and what the effect of that is upon their fellow Muslims and their occupied land. And you remember again, when Allah tells us, don't follow in the footsteps of the demonic. Don't follow in the footsteps of the demonic. You have to have a moral vigilance about you. You have to have a moral consciousness about you. You have to be able to tell the difference between making peace and betraying your muqaddasat, your holy sites, and betraying your Muslim brother and your Muslim sister. You have to be able to ask yourself, why is it that when Israel had the greatest success in signing the so-called peace agreements with Muslim countries, why is it that that same year was the deadliest year on record? Why is it that that same year Israel annexed more lands than ever before? Why is it that that same year Israel elected the most fanatic and extremist government in its history? Without some analytical core, without some moral discernment, you cannot claim to avoid the path of the demonic. When we read that after the Taliban have returned to power, Now, of course, you pause and you think, what the heck was this adventure, American adventure in Iraq and in Afghanistan? We've invaded Afghanistan and we invaded Iraq. We've killed thousands of people, destroyed the lives of thousands of young Americans, men and women, who were taught to butcher and kill, and then brought back to civilian life. And we've literally killed An unknown number, both in Afghanistan and Iraq, an unknown number of Afghanis and Iraqis. Many of them perished on bomb bombings, missiles. Many killed and buried in the desert or in mountains. No numbers, no accounting, only Allah knows. Thousands upon thousands of Muslims li Muslim lives lost. And for what? Iraq is not a democracy. We've installed the most corrupt, the, forgot the name of the 
of the president of Afghanistan, the Khan, uh, whatever his name is, one of the most corrupt regimes ever, was the net result of our military adventurism to create a situation where Israel can further suppress the rights of Palestinians and engage in commercial deals with corrupt regimes that rule over these oil countries in the Gulf. Is that our great achievement? Is that what we as Americans have accomplished? We've created a divided Iraqi society. Antipathy between Sunni and Shia and Kurds. The worst it's ever been because part of dominating Iraq was to play the one against the other. Something that colonizers have been doing forever. And after murdering thousands upon thousands in Afghanistan, the Taliban are radicalized more than ever before. The long struggle of murder and counter-murder, death, pillaging, raping, what do you think is the result of all the sexual assaults committed in Afghanistan? It teaches Afghanis to be more radical, more militant. And so now Afghan, in the Taliban against ban Afghani women from attending universities. And I'm sure in their mind, they're still fighting imperialism and colonialism. And in their mind, keeping Muslim women ignorant and illiterate is a blow against imperialism and colonialism. But what is truly sad is that the invasion was in the path of the demonic. What we did in Afghanistan was part of the demonic. The inability of Muslim countries to do anything about our imperialist policy in Afghanistan and Iraq was part of the demonic. What, what we've accomplished is part of the demonic. And what the Taliban has done in banning Muslim women from attending college is still in the path of the demonic. Do I need to say that it is uncontroverted, undisputed, that the Prophet ﷺ said that education is the right of every Muslim man and woman? Do I need to say that there is no basis in Islamic law for banning women from attaining an education? That the only reason that people like the Taliban think they're scoring one of is for Islam is because the way they were unnaturally and artificially radicalized and drawn to fanaticism because of the amount of violence and the amount of aggression they've grown up with. All of this is in the path of the demonic. The only way we can fight the demonic is with moral consciousness and ethical anchoring. The only way is to listen carefully 
When Allah says you have to have an ethic of care, you have to have an ethic of speaking the truth, of caring for what is right, of upholding what is good. Only that. Only that can help maintain us on the path of the Sirat al Mustaqim and not Khatawat al Shaytan, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repeatedly warned us. Allahumma khfir lana, Allahumma afu anna, Allahumma arhamna ya Rabbal alameen, Allahumma tub alayna ya tawab, wa hadina li aqraba min hadha rashada, la ilaha illa ant. Allah forgive our sins, pardon our, pardon our mistakes, help us to attain the righteous path, and to avoid the footsteps, and avoid following in the footsteps of the demonic. Give us the moral discernment to know the difference between the demonic and the divine, and to avoid the, div the demonic in all that we do, and in every way possible in our life. وصلي وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى اله واصحابه وتوب احسانا الى يوم الدين يا رب العالمين <تصفيق>